This Veterans History Project interview is being conducted with Mr. Donald L. Luan. Mr. Luan served in the United States Navy in the Pacific in World War II. This interview is taking place on Tuesday, June 21st in the year 2005. The interview is being conducted in the auditorium at the Niles Public Library in Niles, Illinois. And my name is Neil O'Shea. Um, Mr. Luan has kindly consented to be interviewed for this project, and here is his story. Um, Mr. Luan, how did you come, what were the circumstances of your entering uh, service? On December 7, 1941, uh, I, I wanted to join, but my father would not let me join. I was only 17 years old. Uh, I was sure that my dad was going to let me in because in World War I, his mother had pulled him out twice because he was underage. And he joined, uh, he was standing in line to join the third time, and he was talking to a guy in front of him, and the guy said, well, why don't we join as brothers? So he joined his brothers. So the next time Grandma heard from him, he was in France, and there wasn't a damn thing she could do about it. And I thought, sure, my dad would be would, would sign the papers for me right away. But I guess Dad understood the horrors of war and uh, tried to delay it as long as he could. And finally, it took a, a year of, uh, of sitting at the dinner table and doing a little bit of squabbling back and forth. And finally, my mother said, sign the papers. He's going to go anyhow. And uh, when I went, uh, at that time, the Navy only had six-year cruises. They didn't have four-year cruises or to the duration. So I signed for six years. I went in on December the 8th, 1942, I believe it was. And I got out in December of 1940, uh, 1948. Had you finished high school? No, sir. I quit high school. Uh, in, this, in this situation with my, with my dad trying to get him to sign the papers. Uh, I had quit high school and uh, I took on any kind of job I could to make a buck and at home that night we went through the same routine until finally uh, he said okay we'll sign the papers. But by that time the Navy would not take a four-year enlistment so I went for six. And I'm not sorry I did. I, uh, uh, I made a lot of friends. I, uh, we still get together uh, we have our reunions on a yearly basis from the, from the WASP. Uh, uh, stood up to a couple of weddings from, from the guys and the whole bit. So uh, I still say once a Navy man, always a Navy man. You're never going to get out of it. You're going to be in the Navy the rest of your life. Uh, but so you didn't, uh, those six years remain uh, uh, a special time in your life and uh, no regrets about high school or no regrets. Leaving home on you know, terms you, with your dad no, or anything? No, no, no. It, 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 my dad, when I, when I finally did get in, my dad was very proud of me. I know that. Uh, the only regret that I have is that uh, after the war, I married uh, my sweetheart, and uh, I had to spend 14 months on Guam. And at that time, that's like 46 and 47, Guam was still in the, theaters, in the throes of, uh, of running around the... They still had a few holdout Japanese guys that would oh, yeah. they'd steal clothes off the clothesline and then get in the chow line, you know, because they were starving and stuff like that. But, so that was the only regret I had was that, that I spent these 14 months away from my bride. Yeah. But we are now married going on 60 years. Beautiful. Beautiful. So, <laughs> Quite a cruise. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so where did you, uh, where were you inducted then? At, at I went into, uh, no, I went, I went in uh, downtown. I don't know the name of the building. And uh, I don't know if you want to put this in there, but the, the shades in the place that we were having our physical, the shades were maybe about a foot and a half down below the, the top of the window. And all of us guys were standing there in, the, in our in our in nude and the, the girls in the next building were standing in the windows watching down at us guys <laughs> my goodness <laughs> so yeah but then uh, there was so uh, god i don't know how many guys in the hall that they swore us in and they separated all of the regular navy guys and uh, the inductees uh they sent them home 
and the regular Navy guys, they gave us a broom and we swept the, the hall, and then they put us on the North Shore, and we went to Great Lakes Naval Air State, I mean Great Lakes uh, a Training Center. And uh, that's where uh, that's where I spent my uh, sleeping in a hammock the first four weeks. A lot of broken noses and broken arms. You know, learning to sleep in a hammock, and then about two weeks later, they gave us cots, or bunk beds. And uh, and then uh, from there, I was transferred over to Navy Pier for aviation machinist mate training, and then I had the training there, and. When I got out of there, uh, they sent me for two weeks or three weeks ab aboard the USS Wolverine on Lake Michigan for further training on uh, flight deck procedures. And then from there, I went to uh, Boston, Mass, to uh, the, the uh, I can't think of the name of the building right now. And, uh, and then I wasn't there maybe two hours, and then they transferred me and about 20 other guys they transferred us right down to the Four River shipyard where the ship was being constructed. And this was the famous, or what would be the famous ship? Uh, this is the Wasp. This is the Wasp. Yeah. So we spent, uh, we, we were right there when, the, when, she, was, when she was being constructed. Uh, our duties there were very, I can't tell you why they had us there, but they had us there. There was uh, 20 of us guys. Anybody you knew from home? In, in, no, 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 no. Well, all total strangers. You'd be surprised how fast you can make friends. <laughs> and uh, so, and then the, sh the ship was commissioned. Uh, we went down to uh, to Trinidad for uh, shakedown cruise. Came back from Trinidad uh, back to Boston, which was our home port. And then they took us in, uh, and then we went right from there right through the canal. Uh, from the canal to Honolulu, Honolulu, right out into the, right out into it. So you're on the Wasp now, are you? Yes, I, all this time I was aboard the Wasp. So you're part of the first crew. Yes, the first crew, okay. and uh, they call us plank owners. And, <laughs> uh, you're according to Navy tradition, you are entitled to one section of plank. You own one pl one plank on that ship, and they give you a certificate. I've got the certificate. And uh, I called the local, uh, when they were going to scrap the ship in 72, I think it was, I called the local uh, radio guy and told him my, my story. And he turned the, the thing over to uh, Senator Percy at that time. And Senator Percy turned it over to the powers that be. And uh, one day in the mail, uh, I got my plank. It's only a small piece of it. And is it is it wood or it's a, it's wood. Yeah. If the flight deck was wood. And well, the uh, flight deck on an aircraft carrier is or was was wood. Oh. Now they're steel. Now they're steel. Yeah, and it was it was surprising too because my family was all standing around when it, and I opened up the package and this beat up old piece of wood was in the deck and I put it down on the floor and I stood on it and kind of wobbled a little bit and I said, you know, it's kind of nice to be back on board again. <laughs> <laughs> back on board the board, yeah. yeah. So, but basically that's it. And from there, uh, it was uh, uh, the Canal Zone, Canal Zone in San Diego, Pearl Harbor, crossed the Dateline, and from there on it was Majero. So when did your officers tell you that you were entering the war zone? They don't tell you. They didn't tell you that, no. no. They, uh, the Navy is the most segregated outfit in the world. Maybe I shouldn't say this. But if you're on board ship, even the paint coloring is different for the crew's color and the, Officer. and the officers. Wow. So that you know that you're in officer's country. So, I mean, it's, uh, of course, the Navy has loosened up quite a bit because you're you had your your uh, uh, your uh, Latinos and, and your colored people. These were more or less uh, uh, they served the, the 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 officers and, and during combat. Well, then they were down in the in the in the hole loading and you know bringing up ammunition and stuff like that. So while the wasp is. 
making its way across the Pacific after it's come through the canal zone. Um, was it carrying ship uh, airplanes at that oh, time? Oh yes, yes. We picked up our air group and and uh, and we had we we were we were battle ready. And when we hit when we hit the uh, the canal zone, we were already uh, our our air group was uh, was, was just in waiting for us in San Diego. Uh, we got a, uh, they were aboard Pearl Harbor. We were already making qualified runs for the pilots, so that the pilots got to make X number of, of carrier landings in order to be qualified. And we went through that whole routine. So, so as an aviation machinist, did you have to service the, every plane every day or once a week? Or no, no. It, it was well. When I first went aboard, I went aboard. I was in the gasoline detail because I was there when they built the ship, and I'd seen where the gas tanks were in a whole bit, and I was in the gasoline detail. And I didn't like being that down far below the decks. And as a result of this, I finally went and angled my way up <coughs> to become what they call a plane captain. A plane captain is probably, or like some, some of the people talk about it like being a squire for a night. Uh, you take care of your aircraft. Uh, you, you're assigned one aircraft, and you maintain that aircraft. You take care of that aircraft just like it was yours. I mean, uh, you baby it if she's hurt. You, you mm -hmm. take care of her. And would the same pilot fly the same plane? No, all, no. no. You have different pilots flying. You know, you never knew. <coughs> the only time that I had, the only time I had uh, the same pilots was when we had the photo planes. I had uh, one of the uh, fighter photo planes, and what they did is they took and uh, they put a camera under the seat of the plane and then he would go in after the after the airstrikes and take photographs and he was not supposed to engage in any combat whatsoever but uh, i had a few of them that they would fire the guns <laughs> or something yeah uh they all of the all of the aircraft had uh, had gun cameras and a couple of times they came in and they said get the film out of the gun camera you know, so you know what they were doing. Yeah, but you never, that was the only time I had, I think I had uh, three pilots that were, and then later uh, I had the, uh, the night fighters, but that only lasted a little while because what they did is they took one of the, the, uh, the smaller carriers and they made a, a, a strictly a night operation out of that. So basically that was the way we operated. So did the, did the WASP move with a group of other ships around it across constantly, the Pacific, like constantly, a, constantly. a battle group or something. We were a battle group, and they uh, they had different you know, Task Force Thirty Eight and Task Force Fifty Eight. It was the same. It was the same uh, uh, ships. The only thing that you traded off was the was the uh, was the admiral. And your admiral was well. We had we had Mister. We had uh, Spruance. We had McCain. And McCain, I thought was was number one guy. McCain. Yeah, he was a salty little guy, and uh, uh, but uh, yeah. So you had these air groups, you know. I mean these uh, these. Uh, so you were, uh, and uh, at the at the early part, we would go in, and usually early morning, you could tell that you were going to go in uh, to the forward area because the whole ship would shake because she was speeding as fast as she could go to get in the position. We'd launch aircraft uh, that day, and then that night we would shake our tails and get the hell out of there because that was at the beginning. We were uh, very fearful of, of land-based Japanese aircraft. And, uh, and then as time wore on, uh, in the Marianas Turkey shoot, when uh, when we were involved at the, at the Turkey shoot, where uh, over uh, the Japanese lost, I don't know, four or five hundred aircraft there, some of their best pilots. Uh, this was uh, covering the invasion of uh, Japan, I mean uh, Saipan, and uh, and then later we we didn't have to do that. We could we could stay there for an hour or two. I mean, stay there for a day or so, you know. And, and cover it, and towards the end, why we just stayed right where we were. So, at. did you ever come under attack from a land-based Japanese oh, plane? Constantly, constantly. Yeah, any time that we were in, why, we were we were under attack. Uh, at one time, uh, 
I think that was in October. This been October of 1940. Maybe 1940. It would have to be 45, 44. I don't know the dates. Yeah. Uh, Slip me. Uh, for three days, we were under constant attack, and uh, the one one day we had, uh, the uh, the cruiser uh, Canberra light cruiser had taken a torpedo. Uh, she was maybe about a thousand yards in front of us, and she took a, a torpedo, and it slowed her down in in the water, and uh, so we we stayed around wait. Know, take care of her. Was that an English or an Australian? No, no, that was an American. An American Amber. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we uh, uh, we stayed there, and then the next night, uh, the uh, the Houston was in the same position that the Canberra was in. Uh, I might have these mixed up as far as mm -hmm. the names of the ship. Then the Houston took it, a torpedo. So uh, we had to stay around. Yeah. From what the pilots were telling us, that they were leaving an oil slick that you could see for 40 miles, and so we were, we had a, a long tail behind us, so the, the Japanese didn't have trouble finding us, and we stayed, we stayed with the, with the two cruisers to, to get them back to uh, uh, Ulithi, and then at, at that time, then I, I, I believe there was another action, and they pulled us away, pulled us away from from this, this, this coverage. We fueled and then we went back out. And uh, I don't know, it's a little bit, a month or so later, uh, we pulled in the Ulithi and uh, the two cruisers were alongside of the repair ship Ajax. And going into the Ulithi was like a, you had one channel that, that every ship had to go into because it's just a big lagoon. And when we got alongside of the cruisers, the guys cheered like you wouldn't believe. I mean, it, uh, it, was, uh, it was exhilarating. I mean, you know, it, it, to know that uh, you had that comradeship where, hey, guys, we stayed there, and we helped, and we did what we could, and uh, we got you home, and that was it. And there were there were other times when uh, under night attack. I remember one night in New Jersey, uh, a radar tracked this sucker. <laughs> they tracked them all the way around, and then New Jersey popped them with about I think about eight rounds of 40 millimeter, and he blew up. It was late at night. That was a a, a, a battleship. A, a Japanese battleship. No, no, American battleship American, oh. in New Jersey. Uh, I don't know if you've ever been at sea at night, but if you go, if you go to the darkest place you can ever find, and that's what it's like at sea, at night with no stars or no moon, it is black. And uh, uh, you, uh, we used to, <laughs> we'd, we'd, we'd cover our, we had a cockpit cover that we had to put over the aircraft so that there was no reflection of the Oh, lights. right, yeah. And we had this, we put that cover on it. And then we'd, we'd put our aircraft to bed at night, and then the next morning, uh, or maybe that, yeah, the next morning, because it was still black outside when we, when we got, went to get our aircraft, and you went to where you thought your aircraft was, and you found out that you were, when the sun, when, the, when it got a little bit light, you found out they were on somebody else's aircraft because it was so dark. But the, you were a plane captain. What kind of a plane was an it? An F-6F F Hellcat. And uh, uh, in my mind, it was the, the best fighter that the United States had at that, uh, I should say, the Navy had. Uh, it's, you don't hear anything about it. Uh, it's, uh, it was powered by a Pratt Whitney engine. Uh, it, uh, they used to come in, when these aircraft used to come in, uh, you can't believe the damage. Uh, tires burnt right off of the, right off of the rim. Uh, gaping holes, and these guys would come in. Uh, and when you, you had aircraft that, uh, that couldn't be repaired, you took, you salvaged what you could, and you dumped them overboard, and you got a new one. And this, 
this is one of the nice things that they did do, or I shouldn't say nice things that they did do, but they had these so-called cheap carriers. And these little carriers were nothing but, they carried nothing but replacement planes. Oh. So we all can't, you know, if we lost an aircraft, we got another aircraft. Of course, when the one that we got, we had to do a lot of work on in order yeah. to get it ship shape again. And uh, and that's that's basically the way the way we operated with it. Now, Mr. Luan, you mentioned that the um, the Wasp took a hit. Yes, it was supposed to be a 555-pound bomb. We had just secured from General Quarters in the morning, and my aircraft was was spotted on a hangar deck. And I was reading the Cornet magazine. I don't know if you remember. You, you vaguely, made, vaguely. It was it was similar to a uh, Reader's Digest. Yeah. And I was sitting in the cockpit of my aircraft, and the and one of the plane, one of my other plane captains came by, and he he waggled the control surfaces, and says, "You're going to go down to Chow." And I said, "Well, let me finish this, and I'm going to go down." And I never saw him again. Mm. Yeah. Uh, when it when it hit. Uh, I jumped out of my aircraft, and the the hangar deck at that location was like about maybe about four inches of steel, four solid inches of steel. And all the way around that hole, there was a, a glow. It was red hot. I mean, it was red hot. I jumped down on the out of my aircraft, and uh, when I got down. Uh, Naturally, there was explosions and fires all over the place, and I ran over to the forward uh, catapult sponsor, and I ran up to Jack Ferryman. And Jack Ferryman was up there with me, and he said, Commander, we got to do something. And I said, I know what we got to do. He said, well, okay, I'll pump. He said, we got gasoline. He said, I'll pump the, the foam, the, the powder into the, into the foam bucket, and you take the hose and little... Uh, little two-inch hose and run it out there, you know, and I said, okay. So I ran out with the hose and he started pumping the, we started pumping some of the foam and uh, there were a couple more explosions out there on the deck and there was another guy coming from the other side, I'd never seen him. Uh, and uh, about that time, what they have is they have what they call a shower curtain. And it's a curtain, a wall of water that just comes straight like Niagara Falls, just comes straight down. And I said, my foam ain't going to do a damn bit of good here. So what I did is I crawled back through the, through the curtain and went back over to the catapult sponsor. And I stayed there until, until everything calmed down, the fires were, were out. And uh, so then I got back to my aircraft and I did an inspection on the aircraft and a whole bit. Uh, naturally, my parachute was soaked. The parachute that I had, they used a parachute for a seat. And the parachute was soaking wet and a whole bit. They said, "Take your aircraft topside and check it out." And they went topside and checked it all out. And uh, the pilot came running over to me and he, he said, "Is this aircraft ready to go?" And I said, "No, sir." I said, "She, she needs a parachute, but other than that, she's in phys good physical shape." He said, "Okay." So I ran down to the parachute loft. I got a new parachute, gave it to him. And, I could see why he wanted to get the hell out of there. I mean, and then the, the later, we were taking some of the guys that weren't they weren't bloody or, or anything, but they were they were out of it. Oh yeah. And uh, you know, taking them down to the aid station, you take them down to the aid station, and uh, I remember if you took when you got the guy down to the aid station, they gave you an apple. I mean, I don't know whose idea it was to give you an apple, but you didn't do it for the apple. You you, you took this guy down. He yeah. he was hurt. He didn't know where he was at. They gave you an apple, and uh, an hour after we after we were hit, we were launching aircraft, and the the whole interior of the ship uh, was was completely uh, completely destroyed. The, the, uh, I talked to some of my shipmates that, uh, that had the job of, of cleaning out uh, after, the, after the hit, 
and uh, these guys were very non-committable about you know when you when you have to pick up human pieces it's uh, mm. it's kind of nothing prepares you for it uh, it's, it's not something that you uh, that you want to do uh, we did have one guy that stepped in the propeller uh, the way the aircraft are spotted on that deck it, you're, they're, they're very close as you can see uh, but I'm, I'm looking for the picture of uh, in order to pump the water out of the out of the hole where the bomb had, had hit we uh, we had to build a, a cage so that the sump, the pump could be down there and uh, so this this was uh, something that, that that had to be done and this date was 19th of March 1945 I'll remember that day as you can see here this is a hole that was made and casualties that day were uh, there were over 400 and some dead and uh, I don't know how many were injured you know that we had uh, it was a uh, was a mess. Uh, the bunk that I had, my bunk was uh, standing on edge. Uh, the locker with the with my clothes in it. Uh, see, on board ship you had a locker, and the locker was maybe about what twenty by twenty or something like that, and and you had all your earthly possessions in there. And. Uh, so my locker was, the locker door was blown open and the whole bit, everything was scattered all over the place. And uh, I remember uh, they sent us down there and I can still see uh, one of the guys, I don't want to mention his name, but he, he was asleep in, you know, in a, in a bunk about three from my, you know, his body was still there, but that's, that's not, that's not nice. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's that's the things that we had. But we did do some crazy things. We crossed the border. I mean, the, the equator uh, had the initiation, which is uh, <laughs> it was something that everybody has to go through. Uh, they had a big tank built up on a on a on a flight deck, <coughs> big water tank. And they, and they had a barber there, and he'd cut your hair, and then he had an assistant with a bucket of graphite grease, and he'd hit you on a, in the mouth with the, or in the face with the graphite grease, and then the, he had a lever, and he'd just dump you over backwards into this tank of water. I remember old Chief Parsons got a hold of me, and he said, oh boy, here, I got you, and they, they keep dunking you in a, grab a holy and dunk you back and forth and tell you, hey, what are you, what are you? And I kept saying, polywalk, polywalk. He kept dunking me. Finally said, I finally decided I was going to show back and I, okay, I'm going to show back and, and they, they throw you out of, the, out of the tank into a, you know, a big long shillelagh line and the whole bit. And uh, so you got that. But there were, like I say, there were times that we had a good time. We had, uh, I remember one night we had uh, uh, sleep was something that you you dearly needed, and the uh, guys woke me up one night and they said you got to come down to the chow hall. They caught a sea bat. What the hell's a sea bat? Oh, you should see it. It's got iridescent green wings and iridescent orange eyes. And oh man, they caught it up on the forecastle. So you get out of the bunk and you crawl down there in your skivvies and you get down there and in the middle of the chow hall they've got this box and the, and the guys keep poking at it with a stick and when you bend over to take a look at it they, they got shillelaghs <laughs> <laughs> I remember old Doc Blue he, he come walking through and one thing you don't do is you don't hit an officer in the day. <laughs> and he went over to look at this thing and they swatted his butt and he was bringing the pilots out one by one <laughs> he was waking them up one by one and bringing them down and show them the sea bed <laughs> Well, we did a lot of great. So we enjoyed it too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, you 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 did things. Uh, <laughs> you did uh, all kinds of. Uh, 
crazy things. But you had to do something to, to break it up. To relieve yeah, the yeah. you were saying the routine or yeah the, 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 the monotony you know it's uh, when you when we provision ship we'd go in you uh, lifted to provision ship because the uh, biggest part of the time we would we would uh, uh, the tankers would come alongside while we were at sea and then they'd fuel us right while we were moving at sea and on one side would be the uh, the, the tanker would be here uh, the tanker would be here and we'd be here. And then alongside the tanker on the other side would be a destroyer fueling up or a cruiser. And that way we were constantly on the move. We'd only be doing maybe eight knots, but we'd be kind of, we called it bombs and beans. And the nice thing about it was we'd get mail call. We'd get our mail. <laughs> and, and you'd, uh, at the beginning we used to, we used, I don't, I'm still to this day I can't understand why they would censor our mail. Because by the time the mail got home, we were somewhere else. Somewhere else, and but they censored the mail, and uh, so we wouldn't we wouldn't write a letter until uh, we heard the tanker was coming alongside, and we real quick. Or even write one. Yeah. Did yeah. you get V mail in those days? No, right? no, no, no. And then they uh, yeah they had a V mail, but it yeah. wasn't. Uh, we never had the we never had it, and I I can remember oh I went to the thirty fifth ship's reunion. And, I, and, and the guy sitting at the registration desk, and I said, Larry Martin, I says, I'll never forget you. I said, you're the guy that wrote a letter to your sweetheart and mailed it to your wife. And his wife was sitting next to him, she said, I'll never let him forget. <laughs> 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 See, when, when, when we would write a letter, if, if, if it, the salutation was Mary and the and the address was Josephine. The, 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 the censor, the pilots were censoring the mail. They would catch it and they'd put it up on a board and you'd go into the wardroom and, you know, correct it. Well, evidently, in one of these letters, he slipped up. And that's what he did. <laughs> so, so it was, you know, had, and then we had a situation where uh, our, uh, our chaplain, uh, when we were in the lagoons, uh, we had our own radio station, WASP, and uh, we had a, a, a guy that uh, was uh, a disc jockey, and we would get uh, records, and then he would play. We could pick up the, the telephone and call down and, and they, the request, you know, and, and he would he would play it, and uh, I know uh, when we got hit. Brandon was his name. He went. He was going to get married when he got back stateside, and uh, so he went over to the submarine base, over to the PX, and he bought all kinds of negligees and stuff. And when he got back to the ship, on his bunk was a Dear John letter. Ooh. And Brandon was our our DJ on that. So, uh, and the girl, his girl that he was going to marry, her name was Mary. And at that time, Wait For Me, Mary was a popular song. So naturally, we kept requesting Wait For Me, Mary. <laughs> Brutal. And we, we, we took about, we bought just about every record in Honolulu that said Wait For Me, Mary, you know. And, uh, but these are things, you know, NASA kiss, and, you know, you do yeah, things, you yeah. do things. But, uh, and then when we would provision ships, I know that one time, I, it was aboard ship. I went aboard the tanker, uh, not a tanker, but a, 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 the ship. And the, he, the guy signaled three of us guys out. He took us up to the locker, opened the locker, and they had a honeydew melon. We hadn't seen a honeydew melon. We hadn't seen a melon in years, you know. It didn't seem like years anyhow. It wasn't that long. And uh, he said, okay, guys, take these over. And he, he gave me the case, and the, you know that case slipped off my shoulder and it broke. You know, so we had to eat the melons that were there. Well, I ate honeydew melon, and honeydew melon, and honeydew melon. I took two of them and I hid them under a tarp. And then I was trying to figure out how the heck I'm going to get them back aboard ship because I got to go on this LCVP. There's no way I could do it. So I got a couple of the guys together and we all ate the honeydew melons. And and honeydew melons, that was it. And I finally got back to the ship, 
And the next morning, one of the guys come by. Hey, Commando, Commando. Go to breakfast. You ain't gonna believe what they got. <laughs> Honeydew melon. Ah. <laughs> but, uh, but then while we were provisioning ships like that, uh, it was nothing to see uh, a guy walking down the deck with a, with a bag of carrots or a head of lettuce, eating it, you know. And uh, one night, uh, 54 cases of crushed pineapple. Uh, in a case, there were six, uh, yeah, six one-gallon cans of crushed pineapple to a case. Fifty-four cases. Not one case hit the deck. I mean, hit the, the store room. And the old chief belly robber, he uh, he put us. He was going to put us all on report. Now this is like about three o'clock in the morning, and he's got us all lined up on the hangar deck, and he's got two yeomen over there taking our names, and he's going to put us all on report the whole bit. And, Somebody said, uh, did anybody wake up John? And Johnny Roosevelt was our supply officer. And somebody went down and woke Johnny Roosevelt up. And Johnny Roosevelt came up on the deck. And he said, Chief, how long has it been since you went to sleep? And he said, I don't know, about 15, 16 hours. He said, I'll bet you're tired. He said, why don't you go below? He says, and hit the sack. And I don't think the Chief was two steps down the ladder when Johnny said, attention, dismissed. That was the end of 54 cases of crushed pineapple. <laughs> but these are these are things that we did. I had I finished up. I had a, a case of 48 cans of pork luncheon meat, which was spam. The Navy called it pork luncheon meat, and I had it hidden down down the forward inner gas room. And on on Wednesdays they used to make fresh bread, so we'd send a guy down to the bakery and he'd get a couple loaves of fresh bread and then we'd eat the spam. We got tired of eating it that way and I got the bright idea, well, I got a clothes iron. So I took the clothes iron, I turned it upside down in a pitcher, an aluminum pitcher, took my sheet knife, sliced off a couple pieces and I fried it. We were frying it on a clothes iron. And we were down at the, at the Ford in a, uh, gas room, is in officer's country. In, this one night we were sitting around there, like four guys sitting around a campfire, <laughs> and this, I think it was Lieutenant Commander, Commander, he stuck his head down the hatch, and he looked, and he said, I'll be us. He said, ain't nobody going to believe this. Ain't nobody going to believe this. And he, and he went, and he never came back. If he had come back, we'd have offered him a sandwich. <laughs> but these, these are things that, uh, you, you remember these things more than you do the, the other things, I mean. Uh, you got to be creative and improvise too. Right? Yes, it's, yes. Yeah. See, a lot of the, you know, like the, uh, a lot of the shops, uh, when I say shops, these are little areas where the guys could, like the uh, sheet metal workers, they had like a hot plate where they could make things and, and stuff like that. The plane captains, we didn't have any of that. We, we had a locker on the, on, the, on the flight deck, and all we had in that locker were our tie-down lines. For, for our aircraft, and we had the we had the braid a knot in them. I mean a a, a a loop in them. We had to braid it in ourselves. So these were very. Uh, you took real good care of them, uh, and maybe once or twice in in a combat situation where you had to where you had to take your knife and cut them. You know to get the aircraft out of the way and the whole bit. But you you. You wouldn't want to do it all the time because it it, it costs you a couple hours of putting the darn nice. making making the making the damn loop in there again. So you a lot of these time during this period you were working you you enjoyed being a plane captain. Yes. Was that the same as being an aviation machinist? Yes. In other words, you you you, you not only you not only took care of the, you took care of the aircraft. I mean, it's, it's, you, you, you made sure that the aircraft was ready to go. Uh, you had checks that you had to pull. You pulled the cowling off the aircraft engines. You, you went through the, make sure that, you know, you, you, had a, you didn't have any major oil leaks, anything along that line. The Pratt Whitney engine was an excellent engine. And it, it, it took very little maintenance uh, to, uh, this aircraft, this engine had 36 spark plugs and two magnetos. And 
that was that was part of the of, of the maintenance. About every 130 hours, I believe, we'd, they'd send it down to engineering, and then engineering was supposed to put in the new spark plugs and so forth and so on. But when they did that, you made sure that you checked it out when when you got your aircraft back again. That all all 36 plugs were in there, and then. Uh, uh, if there was any battle damage, uh, I had one, one, one of my fighters came in, uh, and it had a, uh, the pilot didn't even know he was hit. Uh, it blew out his IFF. Uh, yeah, the IFF is right here. With, IFF is a identification friend or foe. And uh, it, I don't know the techno technical thing about it, but what it does, it, it shows up on a blimp that, it, uh, on the blip on the radar screen that it's a friendly. So uh, what had happened was it, it came in right at the wing root, a 20 millimeter shell came in right at the wing root and right up into the cockpit, and he didn't even know it. And uh, we have uh, self-sealing tanks, so we had to replace, we were up all night replacing that self-sealing tank. We didn't have to. But as a precaution, uh, they had to take that tank, which was, that tank is put in when the aircraft, when, when the aircraft is made. Now you've got to take this tank and you've got to fold it and bend it and tie it and wrap it so that you can get it into this space. And when you get it into that space, then you cut the ropes and it expands. So you can understand. You can understand. Is that the, the gas tank? That's the gas tank. So you can understand Ooh. what you have to do with it. I mean, it's it's it, you're not doing it alone. You you've got three other guys that are working with you in order to get this thing done. And then just about the time you get this thing done, uh, it's time to to go for chow, and then go back to your aircraft again. So like I say, sleep was sleep was. Paramount. You wanted to sleep all the time. Anytime you when you when they when you launched your aircraft, your your aircraft might be gone maybe two three hours. And at that time, you're going to sleep on the deck. You're going to find a place to sleep. You're going to do something. Because as you can see on that uh, when I showed you that uh, our uh, order through the order, day. order through the day. Uh, now here again, you, you're, you're looking at it, okay, at, at, uh, at 10 minutes to 4, they call the Master at Arms. And at, 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 at uh, 4.45 in the morning, they call uh, all hands. And then the uh, general quarters will be sounded in 15 minutes. We always went to battle stations prior to sunrise and sunset. We were such a big silhouette. And at sun, sun, sunset and sunrise, I mean, we were there. So you went, you went to general quarters. Now on this particular day, we went to general quarters first. Normally, on a normal day, we would go to chow first, which would be like two o'clock, and then we'd go to battle stations. So you can see that uh, you were you were out a, a long time. You know, you were up a long time. So sleep was sleep was a thing. And there was always somebody fooling around. There was always some something going on, you know. Did you get a few liberties or uh, recreational periods or we got, shore uh, or something? Or? Uh, when, when Guam was supposed to be secured, they sent us on the beach on a, on a beer party. They gave us three bottles of Iron City beer in green bottles and the beer was as green as the bottles. Or you could get three Cokes. Now, the Marines were still chasing Japanese all over that island. And you put a bunch of uh, drunken sailors out there, why, well, you, <laughs> you got your hands full. <laughs> but uh, basically, this was, uh, yeah, this was the only liberty that we got. I mean, it, it's, uh, if you want to call it liberty. Uh, and then in the lagoon, in you, uh, what they did in Ulithi, they would uh, they would shut down the, the heads on on the say like on the port side of the ship. Well, thank you. On the port side, they would shut down the heads so you wouldn't discharge any any human waste on the on the port side. 
but you've got you got all of these ships in there, and you have a swimming party. Well, I swung down off the rope and into the water, and I came up with a piece of toilet paper wrapped around me, and I got out of there, and I said, "That's enough for me. I ain't gonna swim no more." <laughs> but uh, this was basically this was the only way that uh, I I did uh, I did spend a week on any we talk. Uh, we had a uh, at any we talked they had a uh, a replacement pool for Navy aircraft down at the end of the runway and they had them spotted all the way. Now on these islands, you just had one runway, and it and it and it worked the direction of the wind. And uh, they uh, they had aircraft spotted Navy aircraft spotted all the way down, and then they had the military I mean the Army aircraft in there too. And uh, I guess one day a, a B-24 with a, a couple of 500-pound bombs didn't make it you know, and landed in the middle of this whole depot. So they took five, car five mechanics from each carrier in the lagoon and they sent us to any we talk. We spent a week there checking out aircraft. This one is good, that one is no good, this one is good, that one is no good. And that was, that's what we did there at, uh, at any we talk. And then at, uh, uh, was it Mog Mog or Quadrima? I don't remember. Uh, McCain decided that he didn't like the SB2Cs. Nobody did. They, were, they weren't worth the damn. An SB2C being a? A, a dive bomber. And uh, so we were going to take the pilots from the SB2Cs and take them on the island and a break. Uh, Break them in on the on the Hellcats. So then we were state we were went over there, and then the, the pilots would land, and then they would come back, and, and they'd have to taxi back to take off again. Well, then we would sit on the wing of this aircraft, and we'd direct them through the around the tents to get them off again. And then they would take off, and then they'd fly around, and then we'd land, and then we'd have to go through the same routine. So we would do that for almost a week. You know, breaking these guys in for to change them from SB2C pilots to Hellcat pilots. So these were so you got a break, and the big break you got there was. Inside too, and Mr. Owen, you were saying um, about how you appreciated the change in food. Yes, this was a, the the, uh, the guys on the islands were were basically eating what they call sea ration, which was a combination of it was almost like a, like a corned beef with a, with peas and carrots in it and the, and the whole bit. And uh, this is what, uh, we liked it, but the, the guys on the islands, they, they, like anything else, they, they, were, they were full of it. They also had a concoction uh, that you would pour into an aluminum drinking cup that was supposed to be uh, like a lemonade. And, uh, when you drank it, it felt like it pulled all the feelings out of your teeth. I mean, it was, uh, it was, uh, I don't want to tell you the name, the name that we called it, but <laughs> it was Tiger something. <laughs> but uh, that was, uh, that's what these guys, uh, so we had, uh, they couldn't understand why we would want to eat it. And uh, boy, we ate it, but, and then I don't know if I, uh, uh, we are still on the same side where I said later we had the, on board ship where we had the, the sandwiches and the soup. Now they, they, they came up later and they came up with just a K-ration. And the K-ration consisted of nothing but, but, but you could get a, a can of uh, the scrambled eggs. It would be in jellied form, hot, I mean cold. Uh, a pressed, a dried fruit bar. Uh, what the heck else was in there? A little coffee if you could find a can to, to make it in. And uh, it was, uh, you could live on it. I mean, uh, it's not something that you want to make a, a steady diet of. The sea rations weren't peculiar to a particular uh, no. branch of service? Or no, no, no. The sea ration, sea ration was, well, I don't, know what the, I don't know what the Army called it, but uh, or they probably called it like everybody else did. <laughs> but uh, no, sea ration was, was, was something that... Uh, at some some 
Yeah. Chef. They're, both, they're both nutritionally equivalent. They're yeah, just, yeah, just different. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, C rations were, yeah. and K rations. Well, the, the difference there being that one was warm and the other one was cold. You know, you'd, you'd open a can of, uh, say, of, of uh, bacon and eggs, you know, and, and it was just a little round can, and you'd open it up, and, and that was it. it the K rations were cold. Yes. Yeah. And uh, that was the, the thing that I liked about the K rations was the the pressed uh, dried fruit bar. I used to trade that for I mean trade anything for that because it was it was delicious. And then, like I say, you had the cracker in there. But other than that, why uh, you survived? I joined the Navy. I weighed 124 pounds, and I came out six years later. I weighed 132. So I put on a lot of weight. Now, I talked to a lot of guys that, that went in, and they went in at 132 and came out at 172, you know. But uh, uh, it's just uh, just depending on on what you want to eat and, and how often you want to eat it. But, uh, well, I'm wondering now, um, as the Warren Pacific approaches the conclusion, are you getting you, is the wasp? Closer, getting closer and closer. Yes, to the we're, we're now we're like I said earlier. Now we're going in and we're staying. We're not we're not running in and running out, running in and running out. Now we're 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 in the area, and the very fact that we are staying, we are coming under more a constant attack. I mean, it's uh, a night attack. Uh, uh, and one, uh, I can't remember what day it was. I know we we were chasing a Jap fleet. And uh, we launched aircraft late in the afternoon, knowing full well that these guys were at the extreme range of their gas. Of their gas. And uh, they went out, and we, we launched, I think, about a third of our aircraft. How many would that have been? Well, we had 105 aircraft on board. And uh, that night, uh, these guys were coming back, and they, they said, just turn on the lights so they can find us. If, if the Japanese would have had a submarine out there, they could have sunk half of us. But all we were lit up like a Christmas tree so that we could find these pilots. We had, we had aircraft coming in from, from every carrier. In other words, you didn't look for your own carrier. We had guys coming in. We had uh, crashes on deck where you know, just get the pilot out and get the crew out and, and dump, it. dump it and make rooms because you got another guy coming in. Uh, we never had uh, SBDs. SBDs was a little dive bomber, and uh, the wings never folded on it. And uh, <laughs> I remember that I, I, we uh, uh, sitting up in the cockpit. We, we we brought it down on the hangar deck, and I'm looking all over somewhere where we can. Pull the wings on the guys are shaking this aircraft and looking for it and finally somebody comes by and says the wings don't fold on it. So we would have folded them one way or the other. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you had uh, aircraft and then the, the next morning, why uh, then the, then we sorted out all the aircraft, but we had lost about a half of the third that we had sent out. But we got the pilots back. Uh, they were scattered all over the Pacific. And, we just went back in there and picked them up. And, uh, it was. Uh, so did you have to sail into Tokyo Bay or anything? Or? No, we had uh, uh, prior to uh, the end of the war. Uh, when the uh, well, when the last kamikaze came down on us on August the, August the ninth, nineteen forty-five. Where were you? Uh, we were off of uh, off of uh, Kyushu. And uh, the, uh, I, like I say, I don't, I don't believe this guy was a real, because when he hit the water, he didn't explode. Uh, I came out on deck, I heard, I heard machine gun fire, and I seen two aircraft up there, and one firing at the other one. And I thought, what the hell is that F-6 firing at that Corsair for? And it didn't, when he did a wing over, I seen the meatballs, and I, I knew he wasn't, uh, he wasn't one of ours. And the, uh, our guns opened up, and when our guns opened up, why the uh, uh, the F-6 pulled away. I don't know what the, ca the pilot's name was, but anyhow, uh, he uh, he pulled away. This guy was already flaming, and I looked up and I could see him coming down. And I 
wanted to run, but I didn't know where to run because I seen guys run into it. And I, and I, you know, you, you don't know what to think. And, uh, and about that time, the five inch hit him, a five inch shell hit him and blew him up. And he showered the whole flight deck with, with debris. And it, it, he veered off just enough to fall off onto the, onto the right, the starboard side of the ship. And, uh, and then all of these pieces come fluttering down and I ran over and I picked up a piece. I had a piece of this navigational chart for them. And uh, I, I picked it up and, well, let me have a piece, let me have a piece. Everybody took a piece, so when I finished up, I had a, just a little square is all I had. But the whole damn war would, must have been fought for souvenirs. <laughs> and uh, so uh, now the, uh, the Hornet, I think, is in, uh, in California. They've got her on, in mothballs as a museum. And they've given us one compartment. One, one area that it's all for the USS Wasp. So the hull badge that I had uh, and all the information that I had, I sent down to them and I even sent them the piece of, of uh, chart board that I had. And then just recently in our, in our newspaper, somebody was asking questions about the, the last days of that pilot, that kamikaze or that Japanese guy. And uh, I said, uh, yeah, that's, I gave him the information that I had, you know, that I'd walked out on the deck and I'd seen it. And uh, I seen him coming down, but there wasn't a hell of a lot I could do about it. But uh, because, you know, this is on August the 9th, the war is over, supposedly. And, uh, but uh, then when the time came to, to get into, uh, Tokyo Bay, we got caught in the typhoon, and we lost 30 feet of flight deck. It just pulled it over. As the ship is, you know, you know when, when you're 60 feet above the water, that's six stories above the water, and you see the waves breaking over the top. They're high. They're high. <laughs> and uh, the way the ship was constructed, now they're, they, 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 they've changed the construction of the, of the ships now, but the way the ship was constructed. So when she went up, when she'd go like this, she went up, and then when she'd come down, she'd slam down. So then when she'd slam down, she'd keep you know, perpetually slamming down, and as a result, it would just fold the deck over. So we lost 30 feet of flight deck. That was the second time we lost it. And uh, there was no way that they were going to take us into Tokyo Bay as a cripple. So they sent us back to Pearl, and we went to Pearl. Pearl patched us. They sent us to the canal. We went from the canal right back to Boston. We were one of the first ships back. And I left the ship in Bayonne, New Jersey, because I was in Airedale, and at that time they were preparing her for a magic carpet to take the guys back from Europe. So that was the last time I seen her. You left the Wasp in, in, in Bayonne, Bayonne, New Jersey. But she sailed on for years after? Oh, yeah, all the way through to, until 72. And then they scrapped her in 72. And then when I left the ship, they sent me down to uh, uh, Opalaka, Florida. And I worked on, uh, on the old DC-3s down in Opalaka, Florida. And then they were looking for a volunteer. This guy had two kids. He was second-class mech. He had two kids. And he had to go to Guam. Yeah. He was going to pay me to take his place. Oh, I'm single. What the hell? No. Second class mechanic was yeah. that? Yeah. Second class yeah. aviation yeah. shoes. And, uh, and what the hell? I'm single. I don't have to, nothing to hold. You're a nice guy. Down. Yeah. So he was going to pay me. I said, I ah, forget it. I'll go. And that way, I went in his place, and he stayed in the states with his family. And when I got to Guam, uh, the chief over there asked me. He said, Do you know anything about automobiles? I said, I've been working on automobiles since I was eight years old. And he said, well, I need somebody to work in a, in a squadron garage. He says, you work in a squadron garage for me until I can get a chief petty officer to take your place, and I'll send you back to our five-day school in Moffat, California. So I said, fine. So he sent me, I went, they got a chief petty officer to take my place, and I was, they sent me down to Moffat. I went down to Moffat and uh, went to school there. 
And that's when my wife and I decided we were going to get married. So she called my my uncle lived in in Cal in uh, Moffat, right outside of Moffat there in San Francisco. And my mother and her and my father were out there visiting. And while we were there, I said, "Well, why don't we get married?" She said, "Okay, because the war was over, everything was fine." So when I went, I graduated from R five D school. And I sent a cablegram to Guam for 30 days leave. He granted me 30 days leave. I came home, we got married. I went back to Guam <laughs> for 14 months. <laughs> you had known your wife from, from back oh, in yes. the yeah, neighborhood yeah. in oh, Chicago yeah, or yeah, something? Yeah. Yeah. We had met, uh, we had met uh, our first date was uh, February the 17th. Uh, that was my first day out of boot camp. Uh, that's why we always remember it. Yeah, we went roller skating. And that was so, so it was a bit of a challenge to try and um, the war was over and you're still completing your service yeah. um, requirement yeah. for another another two years another two years almost three years and then uh, uh, when I uh, when I completed my tour of duty on Guam and they sent me to uh, Patuxent River Maryland uh, which is a, uh, a air base that you don't hear hardly anything of I mean they're there it's still going, is it? Oh yes, uh -huh. it's big, it's big. And uh, so from there, and then I was discharged from there. And uh, the fact that I was discharged from Washington, D.C., they paid me $38 and some odd cents to train fare because I was, I enlisted in Chicago and they paid me the train fare to go back. And I still had the telegram that I sent my wife and I said, honey, I'm out, I'm coming home. <laughs> so the fact that you were, you were married I mean, this. Um, some of the questions they suggest that we may ask is, uh, how difficult was it to transition back into civilian life after having been in in the war and having a common purpose, and you know, and you come back. Well, you got to the way the way. Okay, I went in as just I just turned eighteen. I went in as free and easy. Okay, and now for the next almost five years, Uncle Sam has taken care of me. You know, if that's what you want to call it, taking care of me. And uh, now I come out, I'm a married man, and I have a son. I'm 24 years old. I went to the airlines to see if I could get a job at the airlines. This is almost three years after the war is over. All of the guys that were trained in the military, in, in mechanics, aviation mechanics, they're all gone. I mean, they're, they've got their jobs. Uh, yeah, I can get a job at American Airlines, uh, move my family to, to uh, San Francisco, I'll get a buck sixty an hour. It just ain't gonna work. Uh, so the only thing that I had to do was just go out and get a job. And uh, I worked as a, uh, as, a, as a truck mechanic. Uh, I went to work uh, in a uh, in a bakery uh, maintaining uh, packaging machinery i worked uh for uh oh god what else didn't i do i drove a bus i drove a streetcar in the city of chicago uh then i became a, a, and uh, from there i i uh, kind of educated myself a little bit and went into sales you know, and I, I sold uh, cold drawn steel and then I went to work, and believe it or not, I went to work for a Japanese company. My brother worked, uh, it started a, a, a chain company, uh, this is roller chain, similar to conveyor chains, uh, bicycle chain, things along this. And uh, he said, well, come on and work with me. So I worked with him for 15 years, selling Japanese chain. Uh, he quit, he retired from that job. I retired from that job at 65, and he had started a business because of the rapport he had with the Japanese. He uh, started a Japanese bearing business, selling Japanese bearings. And naturally, I went to work for him. So I worked for him for another 18 years, uh, 15 years. So. I'm 80 years old, going on 81 years old. I just retired last January. Wow. And uh, 
the only thing I regret is that I didn't save enough money to give me a uh, a halfway de decent pension. So the money that I that I was able to accumulate and save, this is the money that I'm living on, plus the Social Security. Uh, that's the way things go. <laughs> but other than that, why? Well, uh, I had. I don't think I had any problem uh, adjusting to. Uh, I had to. My big problem was adjusting to family life. I'll say that. Uh, that was a. That was a big step because yeah. you know you're. Let's, let's face it. You're you're not married when you're in there. Yeah. Uh, I never cheated on my wife. I never intended to cheat on my wife. Yeah. Uh, you know the, but. Uh, as far as that went, yeah, I, I had no problem uh, acclimating into it. Um, Maybe it's my heritage. Maybe being Polish that, that makes you, you know, hey, I know my wife wanted me to take time out and, and you know, and get myself adjusted and hold in. I said, hey, I got, I got a, a family to feed. And uh, I'm not going to depend on her father or my father to, to, to feed it. Mr. Lewan, the medals that you received in during the war, yes. your service, could you read those into the into the record for us? <laughs> well, I got the Good Conduct Medal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you seem to have, yeah, on all fronts. <laughs> yeah, and I even, I even got my name on the back of it. Yeah. And then I've got the World War II Victory Medal in the American Theater. And then the Asiatic Pacific, the Asiatic Pacific, that one is, is kind of mute because they say there's five battles that we were in, and basically, there's there's nine battle stars on the on the ribbons, uh, and also you get the Philippine uh, liberation with two battle stars. Now uh, I don't know if they're combined the the nine battle stars. I don't know what's with that. I always call them glory bars and whatever. Uh, I wore them I think twice, and then the Navy unit citation. Yeah, the, that's that's basically the uh, the uh, the units that we. Uh, uh, the medals that I was in, like I say, the, I think you've got a, a readout there on the on the on the five units that I was in. Uh, no, on the uh, on the other one. Uh, you know. Yeah, on this. No, this is the Navy unit citation. There's another one. There should be another one in there. Mm -hmm. There should be another one there somewhere. With the. Uh, You can't tell from from, from no. The see, they don't put the no. They don't put the the, the, uh, the battle stars in there. Okay. No, they just they just have the uh, it, all they've got is good conduct in the in the whole bit, but they don't have the uh, the battle stars. But I thought I brought the, that paper in with the with the battle stars on it. Evidently, I didn't. But well, I can get it to you if you yeah, want it. We still have uh, a lot of information. Um, one book that you brought with brought with you today that's very interesting is this. Um, I think you mentioned it's kind of a yearbook of the. Yes, of it the takes it takes the the was from from the very beginning from the shipyard from the commissioning, all the way through to the last time I seen her. Uh, and there's photographs of of all of the departments. And the, today, out in, in Southern California, where the Hornet is, there's a kind of a yes, where the museum Hornet is, of the wasp. Yeah, in, in one of the compartments, in one of the compartments of the uh, where the uh, where the Hornet is, they've donated one of. The, uh, they, on board ship, you call it a compartment. You would, you as a civilian would call it a room. So it is one room that is set aside for mementos for the for the for the uh, for the wasp. So because we were so-called sister ships, wasp and a hornet both being yeah. And there's always been a wasp or a hornet in the in the uh, in the United States Navy. And your organ there's an organization based on the wasp, which yes. continues to this to this very day. Yes, this is the. Uh, uh, the Wasp Spirit. It's a quarterly publication of the USS Wasp, the CV, the CVA, the CVS uh, 18, and 
<coughs> Incorporated. Uh, it was founded in 1943, and for all those who serve <coughs> aboard any of the WASPs, it's a non-profit a non-profit organization licensed by the Commonwealth of Mass. And if anybody wants any further information on it, uh, they can get a hold of, uh, of Vince at P.O. Box uh, 248 in Woburn, Mass. It's Mr. Polito? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, the, the, the zip on that is 01801-0248. And it costs you 15 bucks to belong to it, and you'll get a quarterly letter. And basically what it does, it just keeps bringing everybody up to date as to what uh, what's going on with our with with the shipmates and with the ships our reunions we have a reunion every year and uh, it's uh, it brings back uh, brings back a lot of memories anybody that's uh, well, thank you for sharing so many of them with us uh, this afternoon. Thank you for a very uh, generous and uh, detailed and colorful uh, interview. I, I can remember one instance with, uh, we had a gentleman aboard ship, you know, in the Navy or in the, in the military, I don't care where you're at, they have a habit of hanging a tag on you. And uh, unbeknownst to me, when I was going through Navy Pier for Mech School, uh, they had an obstacle course, and I used to love to run that obstacle course. And there was 300 guys in the company, and what I would do is I would work my way up to the front of the company, and I'd run that thing, and then I'd go and wait in the back, and then I'd run it again. So I'd actually run it twice a day. And so they tagged me with the commando. Right, you meant commando. Yeah. And that's how I got that name. And uh, I'll get a phone call every, you know, hey, Commando, that you, you know, <laughs> and uh, so, but you've got these guys. Now we had another guy, uh, his name is Gordon, and uh, uh, I never knew what his last name was, or what his first name was. He was always Flash, and uh, I can remember we were loading loading ammunition, they had a 1,600-pound a uh armor-piercing bomb, and we had it on these little skids, a little truck-like, and you were supposed to put a strap across to hold them down, and we never did that. And we, the guy was bringing this thing in, and, and they had a little ramp over the combing. You know how a deck is on, on I mean, a, a hatch is on board ship? It don't go all the way down to the deck. So they had a little ramp to go over that, that little thing. And this guy comes up with this little thing, and he squeezes it up, and he hits it, and when he hits it, this 1,600 pound bomb. Now they're not armed, so you don't have to worry about them. It slides across the deck, and Flash Gordon is standing over on that side, and he sees this thing coming. And what he does is he puts his fingers, closes his eyes, puts his fingers in his ears, and he raises his knee like, ooh, you know. <laughs> and every time I see him, I tell him, hey, Flash, I remember that. I'll never forget it. Because if that sucker went off, he'd have never known it. <laughs> but, uh, if you want, I can leave this book with you, and you can take a look through it. Uh, give you some idea of. Uh, yeah, I might be able to take some uh, scan a couple of pictures out of there. Yeah, that yeah. would be okay with you. Sure. Yeah. Uh, like I say, the 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 one thing that I did take out was the there was a list of the guys that were killed. I took it yeah. out, and then I'll um, when I. When you come in to pick up your transcript and copy, do the proofing, I can give the book back right. to you at that time. Is that okay? Sounds good. And then if there's anything more you want to add to the interview at that point, it's okay. But well, I think we have, we've got, we've done, we've done, you've done a very good job today. Thank you very much. Well, as you, as you can see. Yeah. Yep, but it's hard to believe that it was 60 years ago that all this happened. Yeah, 60 years, ex yeah. But, uh, yeah, we still get together, but there's fewer and fewer of us. Yeah, that's why it's, yeah. So it's great that we're getting uh, the yeah. countdown here. Thank you, Mr. But like I say, the biggest thing there was monotony. Yeah. Monotony. And sleep. I, I can sleep real good now, and my <laughs> wife always comes. I sleep too much. 
on that note, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Luan. Thank you.